Coach Hill, tonight let's talk about the NCAA Clearinghouse. You are a coach for Kent State University. You guys are a Division I yes. uh, affiliate. And you also were a Division I athlete for Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, correct? That's correct. All right, so let's talk uh, NCAA Clearinghouse. First thing, Coach, is there anything that you guys particularly look for when you're looking for a student athlete to recruit them at Kent State University? Um, yeah, there's, there's several different things we look for. Um, we always look for a good student. Um, you know, we, we encourage in, you know, the other coaches that we encourage to go out and find good students. Um, we like to find kids with good grades. Um, usually those type of students, they are the, you know, better overall student athlete when it comes down to, you know, a college atmosphere. Um, we don't discredit against kids that, you know, don't, do have subpar grades, you know, but uh, we, we, we also give them a chance and we go after them as well. It just all depends on a particular situation. Everybody's different when it comes to recruiting, recruiting process. Um, but uh, gr grades is, is very important. Um, we look for kids with good grades because a lot of times those are the type of kids who are going to make it for a full four or five years with us as a student athlete. Um, you know, other things we look for, you know, we, we reputation. Um, we ask coaches, uh, high school coaches. Um, we call up, uh, you know, when we call up a high school to get a transcript, we actually ask the, uh, the secretaries because they know a lot about the kids at the school. They'll tell you if he's a good kid or a bad kid. Um, you know, social media is a big factor. Uh, you know, kids tend to put everything and anything out there on the internet to uh, and express what whatever's going on in their life. And you know, if we don't like what we see, sometimes we might you know, won't make a phone call or you know just kind of you know go a different direction with another type of student athlete. So it's very important, kids out there that are uh, you know on the internet with their social media, please be careful what you put up there. And you know, so that type of stuff. Um, and then obviously performance, you know, ability, you know, uh, what type of, uh, you know, what you can cont contribute to our team, stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of factors, but, um, you know, grades, uh, behavior, you know, obviously is a big one, you know, coming down from, you know, the word of mouth from coaches, other coaches, you know, past alumni from your high school. Um, you know, our, our ears are wide open when it comes to those type of things, and we, we listen very well because... We're investing in a lot of these kids. We give them, you know, money to come to our school with a scholarship, academic aid, or, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, it's important that kids, uh, you know, really think about what they're doing, who they're hanging out with, and, you know, what direction they're taking as a young high school kid, especially with all the crazy technology today. When you talk uh, to kids, or when you look for and you're recruiting a kid, can you see what a kid has an it factor? Um, I guess the it factor would be Dustin Kilgore. He's attempting to win his second NCAA title for you. He's an NCAA champion. Yes. First in the school history in wrestling and like one of the second in any other sport. Yeah. Uh, how can you guys figure out what that it factor is? It, it, is every kid a Division One NCAA athlete? There are obviously other levels, NCAA Division Two, yeah. Three, NAI, Junior College, um, things like that. How do you find that it factor and how important is that to recruit a kid with that it factor? To be honest, the it factor, it's a very difficult thing to, to identify. Um, and there are very well leading, you know, variables that, um, that we as coaches look for and, and that we know of and, you know, what a kid is doing in the off season, what a kid is doing, you know, during the season, um, what types of uh, clubs he's involved in, uh, how much he's competing, uh, you know, uh, his, his behavior after he takes a loss off the wrestling mat. Um, there's things you see, the, the way he pushes the pace, the way, you know, if he gets a back call door in a match, does he cry about it, look up in the air and go crazy, or is he, you know, back in the middle with it, you know, in his wrestling stance ready to go? Is that a maturity level thing, do you think? Yeah, it's maturity. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's a type of program, you know, environment, you come, come up with a type of wrestling program that you uh, are involved in. Uh, this could be an across-the-board thing for basketball. Yeah, football. I mean, obviously, we... We're a different type of sport when it comes to a sport like basketball or football. Uh, in the, in the same comparison, you know, as for us, then they're, they're, we're not going to, you know, we're recruiting a kid, maybe he's just really good in one position, he's really good at, you know, doing certain things, but, you know, uh, you know, football could be a different aspect the way they recruit a kid. But, I mean, when you get down to the nitty gritty, you know, character, you know, 
core values in a kid, um, talk kid on a kid, talk kid on the phone. You know, what's your goals? Where you, what do you want to do in the next five years? Where do you see yourself in the next couple of years? Stuff like that. Those are important factors that we like to go over with recruits. Um, work ethic. Work ethic. Um, and thing is, as a college wrestling coach, we, we know who's who. Um, it's a very uh, nowadays. It's a very uh, I guess way media wise, kids in high school and you know the websites and your website and stuff like that. We're able to get better looks at kids, you know, better better feels for them. You know, before when I was coming up in college, uh, you know, there was no one standing on the mat side after a championship. You wanted to get to talk to you, and we we get to know about just from a four or five minute interview after a kid wrestles a match. We you get to know what kind of kid they are, and you know, I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing. It's just. You just get a feel for a kid and what you know what what, what type of person is just through a five minute interview sometimes not all the time but sometimes because a kid could be shy you know and not really good on the camera I mean when I was growing up in high school I couldn't talk in front of people at all so stuff like that but all right let's talk about the the uh, NCA clearinghouse let's talk Division one to start out with yeah Division one and Division two are both uh, you have there's a thing called the NCA clearinghouse eligibility center. Um, www.eligibilitycenter.com. You go there. Um, you have to begin the process when you're a ninth grader. Um, it, it starts in ninth grade. So you're telling me that these kids need to start looking out for what they're doing academically in ninth grade if they want to be a college athlete. Yes, yes. That's yeah. not just something you're saying. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. I had an issue when I was a kid. When I was 12th grade, I had to fix my classes in college. I mean, fix my classes to get in to be a Division One college athlete. What, what, what happened specifically? Um... I had a I had a ninth grade English class that I just I didn't go on with teacher. It was a college prep class. It was the only college prep class available in my ninth grade high school. Um, I ended up uh, you know not taking that teacher, and uh, I took a non college prep class, you know, a college English class, and um, you know didn't think about it to my senior year. My counselor luckily was on top of you know, the NCAA eligibility center and, you know, the, uh, the rules and what I needed. And, uh, he came to me, um, pretty much right before my senior started, right, right that first week, actually, I remember he's like, Matt, we have to get your ninth grade English caught up with that. So, uh, I said, well, let's take ninth grade English. And so I ended up taking ninth grade English while I was a senior taking senior. So I took two different English classes when I was a senior in high school I, and it went well. And so. it's something that your counselor, it's very important for them to be into. Yeah. And don't be afraid to ask your counselors when you're, you know, what, what do I need to do? Where am I at? You know, how am I, what's my progression? Am I on, on my own course to my 16 core credits as a division one athlete, division two athletes need 14 core credits. Um, and those rank, uh, the exact list is uh, four, for 16 core credits, you need four English, uh, three different maths, um, that's seven. So, And then there's, uh, there's some physical sciences and uh, nature sciences, ge ge geography. Um, it has to add up to 16 core credits. I don't know exactly the courses you do, but your counselor should have a good idea. I mean, that's what their, their job is, to, you know, those types of things, is to keep you on course to be a Division One or Division Two. Uh, eligible for the clearinghouse. So you, you actually had the list in front of you? Um, yeah. It's 16 core classes for... A Division one Division athlete. One. If you okay. future Division one athlete. Okay, Division two is... It's a 14 core credits. 14 core credits. Yeah. So their, their standards are actually lower. Division two is a little bit lower. Certain certain aspects of the Division two are lower. What about NCAA Division three? Do they have standards, Coach Hill? Um, from my understanding, uh, Division three, they actually go straight through the university when it comes to those types of things with the, uh, with the amateurism and the uh, college standards. It's up to them, and they police that. Um, and they, they have their own policing system when it comes to Division three. So they leave it up to the institution? Yeah, leave it up to because it's a smaller, smaller school, smaller atmosphere. There's not as many athletes. Okay. So, so we talk um, about this NCAA Division one clearinghouse, and you talk yeah. about the website. What's the website again? Uh, the eligibilitycenter.com. Eligibilitycenter.com. Okay, Pretty when sure, I go yeah. to eligibilitycenter.com, I notice some things that they're talking about a sliding scale. I don't yeah. quite understand what the sliding scale is. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Well, when you go on the eligibility center, it's really clear. There's two options. You know, one for administrators in high schools and one for future student athletes. You click on there. You register your stuff. There's a fee. Every every athlete who wants to go Division two, or Division one has to do this. It's just part of the process. And um, and that, from there, you know, once you establish that you're, you you want to be a Division One or Division Two athlete, you uh, 
you have certain standards like the court, 16 court. The sliding scale, what it is, it's a comparison of where your GPA is versus where your test scores are, ACT or SAT. So the higher the G, higher GPA, the lower your SAT or ACT scores could be. So if you have a 3.5, you can score a lot lower ACT or ACT score, SAT or ACT score on your on your test. If you have a low GPA, your uh, ACT or SAT score has to be higher. So that's what I mean by slider scale. So if I can put my hands up, so your GPA is here and your uh, your test scores are down here, you know, they, they have to equal up because your GPA has to be high, your test scores are lower. But if it's, you know, GPA is down along with your, you know, along with your uh, score level, you know, it has to be a certain level. That's why I call it sliding scale. So the higher, the higher your GPA is, you know, your, your, your test scores can go lower, you know, but the lower your GPA is, the higher your test score has to go. So, is there a minimum GPA, core GPA? Um, it's a 2.0 in Division I. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I had to quote me on it. I'm pretty sure it's a 2.0. Um, and then uh, with Division II, I think it's 2.0 as well. Is there a, a minimum test score? Um, if your GPA is up in 3.55, I think your test scores can be ACT around like 11 or... Uh, or uh, maybe, around about 11. Yeah, 11. And what can the ACT be? The, uh, well, the SAT would be like the higher number, would be like a 400 or 500. It'd okay. be, it's pretty low. It's very rare that happens, okay. but it's pretty low. And what's an ACT? What's the high, lowest ACT that they get in with? Like scores? 11. Like the total score, like they have the total uh, composite scores. Um, they're like, uh, I think it's like a 38 or something. So that's your, your all them four disciplines added up to 38. So it's not a very high score. But your GPA has to be very high to have that low of a score. Gotcha. Okay. So, so when we talk about this, um, we talk about the core classes. They have to be college preparatory classes, correct? Yes. Have to be they can be honors or college prep. Yeah. They have to be, uh, and if they're remedial, that's it's, something where they have to look at it. And if they're in a class that's below college prep, yeah, they have to make sure that they're not taking a remedial course because it doesn't count towards their, their, their core classes. Core. Okay. Um, I'm recruiting actually a student right now from... In California, I mean, he signed a letter with us. He's on the he's on the cusp of, you know, ACT versus GPA. So we're we're working with him, and he's actually fifteen. He actually has fifteen and a half court credits. So he he actually has to go this summer before he comes on to our college campus, and take uh, a one credit college prep class, high school college prep class, and his high school offers it. What happens if a student athlete does not pass the NCAA clearinghouse? What happens at Division One level? I'm not sure Division Two level, and uh, and they they might be similar. Um, but the uh, Division One level, you will have to sit out a year without any financial aid, without any academic, not academic, uh, athletic financial aid from us. So you can't re receive scholarship, um, and you can't practice or compete with us. You can use a strength conditioning. Uh, you know, facilities, you can use a strength conditioning coach, you can, you know, lift on your own in, in the facilities, but you can't uh, practice, you know, or travel or compete with us. You can um, use our academic services through our, you know, or something we call the Academic Resource Center. Uh, you know, you can use those services because you are on a roster, but you're not an active student athlete with us and you do not receive scholarship from us. They, you cannot give them any grant aid, no scholarship. Money. Yeah. They're or, paying for school. They're so paying for school. So uh, there's there's tons of examples uh, out there uh, that, that I can think of a kid like uh, a famous one you can think of uh, Josh Koscheck MMA UFC fighter he was a they call him they used to call him prop forty nines prop forty eight prop forty eight forty eights yeah he's called prop forty eights now he's called a non qualifier he was a non qualifier his first year at Edinburgh um, and then you know he went on to be a four time All American national champ and now he's a He's a businessman slash MMA fighter in California. Fights George St. Pierre for the yeah, UFC title. Yeah, yeah. So, but, you know, it's one of the things. It's not, the, here's the thing you got to remember. It's not the end of the world. If you're a non-qualifier, you just got to stick it out. You know, you're going to go, you, if you had plans going to go to school, you know, you know, just, you know, find a school that's going to work out for you. Find a school that's going to, you know, fit your needs, you know, and, you know, then you can, you know, a lot of times if you do all the right things and you have agreements with the previous coaches, they, they fulfill your scholarship the following year, and then you're back, your regular college student. And it's it's not, it's, 
it's not uncommon that kids become non qualifiers, maybe because of a small mistake and you know, from a counselor, from you know, a teacher or not, or from themselves, you know, so it's one of those things. And is there a way to circumvent that? Is there a way that they can go compete maybe at a lower level in the NAIA or the junior college? It's a very it's it's tough because the junior college Definitely, they can do that. They have community to be, college. Yeah, community right. college. They, they can do that, and then they have to prove themselves uh, by graduating from the two-year college, uh, community college, and then um, once the uh, once that's done, you know, we can recruit you back to our school as a you know as a transfer in. You know? But you, they won't have the full four years of eligibility. To- you won't once your clock starts. It starts at any. Uh, any school. I mean, at least at Division One, your clock starts. Your first your clock year. starts at twelve hours. Yeah, it's clock, clock start. Once you get twelve hours, your clock starts. That's a full time student. It's a full time student, and then you uh, you have five years unless you go on a mission, as a, you know, as a you know, Mormon. Mormon Mormons do that. Or, you know, whatever organization. You Religion. Do, you you have a catastrophic illness. You know, or take a hiatus year. Yeah, and, or if you're you military stuff. Okay, so yeah. those are the three exceptions, basically. Yeah, it might be something else that you know you can think of, but those are pretty much the most common ones that. Okay, occur. last thing I want to ask you about is the sliding scale. We figured out it's an ACT, SAT, GPA, yeah. core GPA. Um, things like uh, g- gym class, physical education. Yeah, uh, those wood, are wood tech. Yeah, those uh, are things like tech. ceramics and you know cert. You know, those are things that. Uh, you know, if you're on the borderline of especially GPA, because those aren't core classes. And that's the other thing we forgot to discuss was your GPA in that slider scale, they have to be core class GPAs. So, I mean, so you can have A's in ceramics, gym, and, you know, uh, basket weaving, but those don't count towards your core GPA um, on that sliding scale level. So only the classes of your 16 credits or 14 credits count on that sliding scale. So all your Englishes and you know maths and geosciences and social studies and you know whatever one that categorize in that sixteen credits those are the ones that count towards your GPA. So that's important just because you have you know A's in gym class all four years in high school those don't count towards your core GPA. Um, and we do run into that instance a lot on looking at transcripts and identifying your core GPA versus your overall GPA because it's. Core GPA versus overall GPA are definitely different when it comes to eligibility center and being an NCAA Division One or Division Two athlete. Okay, last thing. Um, can you tell us the difference between a head count sport and an equivalency sport? What What does that mean? And I don't think a lot of people understand how scholarship money actually yeah. works. Can you explain that? Yeah, there's there's sports called equivalency, and that's the type of sport I coach, uh, wrestling, and there's head count. Head count would be your football, basketball, women's volleyball, uh, so who's the other ones, gymnastics. Um, and the, what a headcount sport means is when you're recruited, um, you either get a walk-on, you're either a walk-on or you're a full scholarship athlete. You're a full aid athlete. You get the full amount. Um, so so football, they have 85, Division One football schools have 85 scholarships. And every person that's offered a scholarship is full, full, price of that university or full tuition slash, you know, room and board, um, you know, and same with, uh, and, and they have a number. So I think basketball is at 12 or 13, uh, women's gymnastics is at 18 or maybe lower than that, but they're like, women's gymnastics is 10 or 12. I okay. Think. And then I was thinking of that. Uh, yeah. But there's, so the athletes that are recruited and offered scholarship they're that's full scholarships, full tuition and board and you know and whatever else expenses that are included in that particular university. An all or none situation. Yeah, let's put that. It's easier that way. Yeah. All or none. Yeah. You're either getting your room, your meal card, your meal plan, mm-hmm. books, and all of your tuition paid for or you're not. Yeah. So you're you considered a, a, a preferred walk on. Okay. Something like that. So Equ- the- equivalency would be my type of sport. So you have college baseball, uh College women's track and field, men's track and field, wrestling. Uh, I don't know, can name other ones, I, but those ones that they are uh, baseball, called, softball, yeah, equivalencies, and what that can range from. It can range. You could have a full scholarship, or you can have you can be on a two hundred dollar book scholarship, and th- it ranges from that that scale all the way over there. So you have full scholarship over to a book scholarship, um, and that's the hardest part about our job as coaches is to put a price on a kid's head and what he's worth and what our investment is to him. So it makes it, makes it tough sometimes when it comes to recruiting because you have to uh, explain these things first off because a lot of people are unaware of what scholarships 
you know, what kind of scholarships are available, how they work, you know, how much scholarships you have in your program. How um, many do you have in your program? Our scho- uh, we have 9.9 scholarships on Kent State Wrestling's, you know, uh, scholarship allotment. We're allowed, NCA allows you to have nine points. So we have a full scholarship allotment. How many? Allow, how allowed many, by uh, NCA. It, it went off screen. Yeah, you're fine. How many, uh, okay. how many uh, student athletes do you think, could you say they're on full, full scholarships right now? On our wrestling team? Yeah. One. One. And then how many uh, student athletes are on partial well, s- scholarships? 20? Put it this way. We're allowed 9.9. We have 35 guys on our team. So one way or another, about 24 to 25 guys are paying. You know, if you average it all out, it doesn't work that way. But if you average out, you put this guy's money with that guy's money and then what he's on and what he's not on, 25 people are paying to come to Kent State on our team. First wow. five. Uh, we have, um, you know, everybody's different, like I said. There can be, you know, when it comes to scholarships, just to give you a quick rundown, a, a kid can not pay a dime to go to school, but he has other factors on his uh, financial situation or academic situation. So we can, have a, we can have a student that had really good grades in high school and really good test scores and comes to Kent State, applies, and let's say Kent State awards good students in, with good grades and good academics from out of state, and because they want to bring more out of state kids up in the Kent State, they if a kid has, um, let's say a twelve fifty on his SAT or a twenty eight on his ACT, and you know in a in a three point eight GPA core credits, um, we uh, th- they'll get you know a forty percent scholarship that doesn't count against our our nine point nine scholarship. And, and what, if say, their, what if their parents socioeconomics play? Yeah, as parents, well. they say they don't make as much money, and they, and they apply for the FAFSA. FAFSA, and they uh, will get grant money from the state. So then they'll get another, you know, four to five, six thousand dollars in grant money from the state, or I mean, from the federal government. So right there, let's say he's smart and his parents don't make a lot of money. You know, they're already looking at a, uh, you know, they have fifty percent of their school paid here at Kent, and then we add uh, another thirty percent in scholarship money. You know, then he has a pretty good uh, package put together for him, and those are. Um, you know, those are, that, it's a great situation when you have a fine kid that, you know, has good academics, you know, and, and is able to, you know, bring that extra, you know, incentive to our university while we can help them out financially through a scholarship, ac- uh, athletic scholarship. And uh, there, everybody's different, like I said, there's no cookie cutter in equivalency sports. With, with head sports, it's a cookie cutter recruiting process because you're either getting a full allotment or nothing, so... All right, Coach. Thank you for the time. You got any luck for me? Good luck, guys, with your uh, college uh, search and everything else. Take care.